Ah, kia ora, whānau, right round the motu. Ko ore mu keras and takuri ngō, nā te āwa tūwhuri tō te arawa me a tainui akariwi. It's been a long journey. It's been a long, long journey, and of course, with Ken's uh, impression of where we need to go, I certainly back it wholeheartedly. You know, uh, we've been struggling and struggling for many, many years, going back to my queer, living with her in a Rapo Fare on the Tarawera River. So I was brought up with my koro karawa um, within the fishing boundaries of our tuna. So what got me really started was going back to when they were building the dam at Matahina in the early 60s. I was part of that, um, doing the dam, driving bulldozers, etc not to realise that the damage of these power stations would do to our whole environment for our tuna. So I've been working constantly um, regards of both power companies. We have three dams on the Langataiki River, the Ofeo, um, Taro, um Marahina and uh, the one right in the middle, uh, I've forgotten its name, <laughs> but never mind. When I first knew what was happening, and uh, as you see in those pictures there, um, I went back to the farm with my wife in Galatea and we were only a mile away from the dam itself. So it was at the right time for the adult eels to start going back to the ocean, Tangaroa. So I said to my wife, I need to go down there and see what is happening. So when I got there, on the concrete pad, the, the, the two guys that were running the dam were having smoke, and they didn't even know I was there anyway and to, to walk down the road towards the penstock screens and to see what I had to see was so devastating. To look at over a hundred odd eels laying on the concrete, battered, cut in half, you name it, they had it, bruises. I went down to the power station, I got the two guys out, brought them back up top, what happens to these fellas? Oh, we throw them back in the trailer and we bury them up in the rubbish dump. Momo. From that day over, I stopped that issue so that we were there every time the movements were on and to make sure, even though we did have losses, that we could use those to feed our koroa. There was nothing wrong with them. Feed our koroa, the queer, right round our areas in the Bay of Plenty. It's been a long journey and one that uh, might be coming to the end of. Um, it's been a total since 1988 when I got involved. So it's an eye on 40 years that uh, uh, we'd been working this system Transferring the Elvis was another big program where I got involved with ECNZ, the builders of the dam, where they called me in and to advise how they could um, do the Elvis movements. So they carried on their merry way with science and technology and I had already warned them the way they were going with it, it would never work, not in a hundred years. Our baby elvers haven't got wings. They can't fly. So you need to put in something 
in play where they can come up in their natural movement, climb the dam or the overpass. But it never really happened. Um, I worked with a gentleman, um, Jacques Booby. We were all part of the system. And I said to Jacques then, uh, you know, Jacques, it's not going to work. So anyway, it cost him 1.7 million to put the fish passage in. The first year they got 23,000. Second year was 33,000. And the third year was 20. So they had actually, with Neewa, they'd put a counter in the fish passage up on top of the dam. So when they, whatever the, the year was done, or climb, they would go past the counter. However, we knew there was something going amiss. So we'd found a net on our trapping station that we'd already put in also. And then it put two and two together that someone was going down, putting air eels in the buckets, carrying them up through the lift and pouring them in front of the, the camera. From that day on, we took over. Um, I've got some figures here, and uh, just to, to give you an emphasis on how many we've really moved. Uh, and um, we're looking at going back to when we started, and um, a total figure overall would be 70 million. Last year alone, or the year 2015-16, we moved 7,727 kgs of baby elephants. That's seven and three quarter ton. To put an equation to the numbers, when you've got probably 10% of that catch are really small baby elvis, then we have the long fin, and then the short fin, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the journey and the time frame for, for us was quite long. I would leave home at five in the morning. My son, if I need them, I would give him a phone call, meet me there, and we could do anything up to five trips a day, just transferring from Marihina, Anifanua, right through to Mudapara, Furunaki, vice versa. In all those catches, consequently, we were catching huge amounts of kokapu. So with the kokapu, we had to reverse our transfers to good streams so they could survive. So that was another option that we had. From there, we were getting shrimps, common bullies, and even freshwater coda. So we were put into a time frame of what we moved first and who we left till last. My oxygen tanks could hold anything up to 75 to 80 kgs. Uh, without any losses, I could travel up to 150 k's. Uh, we had our oxygen pumps in. And it was our choice to where we did the transfers. So if there were small lots, we would drop them inside Marihina first. As the lots got larger, we would use Anupanua, Mahoramanga, and up Mutapara, the Furunaki, and areas like that. So we were doing quite a large mileage per week uh, in our travels. But we loved it. It was something exciting, because we were doing something not for this generation, but for the next two generations of our children. Because if we don't go down that track, our next two generations won't have anything. So I agree with the King. We need to put this issue 
through the people that automatically try to control us. So we have council, we have BOP environment, and people, other issues in regards to that. Overall, um, when, you, when you start doing your data, and we do all the data, we, we, we do the, all the data, we show the, the amount, the movement, the, everything, and we, we send it to MPI or, and everything like that. So we can go back, we know exactly how many we put in that river. It's so bad news from our last flood, which flooded Edgecombe out, um, and so devastating of having put two lots of big catches through that catchment. The percentage rate of loss would be 95%. So we'll let Mahi, are we doing it right or what are we doing wrong? What else can we do? I'm on my Iyana Kuria Fare Tihidao for Nati Awa as their fresh water. But I also work with all our, our people right round Te Arawa, Tupuritu, etc. So it's been a long journey for me. And it's, I got really started in the Hanua Ranges many years ago. And I was teaching children at their camp in the Hanua Ranges, taking them out on healing nights, etc., smoking them, putting them in the umu, fry them up, and, uh, you know, so it's been a long, 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 long journey. I'm due to change that model and I'll introduce you to my son who I hope he will come on board for next year. If he doesn't, well, I'm stuck with it again. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's so wonderful to be here and I've got to thank Ken Mayer and his team and all the girls and all you people for being part of this whole issue. For us, we were only there for our Karoa Kriya and our children uh, to keep our kai going. You know, going out with those Karoas and you see all the different ways that they used to have methods of catching your tuna and that, whether it be in a small stream or in a lagoon or in a lake or in a river. They were absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I devised a new catching program on the adult eels within the lakes. When I was in Canada, I visited a few power stations. I ended up going up with the Royal Mounties, etc. I was engineering in Canada. I was working for an American crowd in from Mangare, and uh, I was traveling on their behalf every four months to their factories. And, uh, you know, bringing those people back to here, to New Zealand, including the Indian nation, was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that's what really kept me going. My wife, she was so lovely, beautiful, and she worked so hard. You know, we would get 35, 40 students, and there wasn't a problem to call all the daughters up, and we have many. And we, they would look after the, the visitors. We would take them out on night um, surveys and everything like that. So, uh, and being with Awanui Arangi in Fokatani was also another bonus. I had a couple of uh, European students come through. Within two years, they become their doctorate. So that's another bonus. And um, consequently, um, 
I was awarded the award through our new year, and, uh, and it's been absolutely fabulous. A distinguished fellow of science. And uh, what can I say? You know, what's going to happen in the next 20 years? Where do, which track do we go down? Do we look at starting to grow our own? Put ponds in, where you've got good accommodation to make good ponds, and it's not hard. I was told you couldn't feed uh, baby longfin. We have no problems. We have no problems feeding baby longfin. So I've also applied now to have our six big tanks put in play. I'm looking at starting a research centre on the farm and uh, see where we go from that. But overall, um, I've got to acknowledge everybody uh, that has arrived. And, uh, and I'm hoping that what you see there just gives you a focus what happens from hydropower schemes. So, um, our netting gear was nothing but the best. I bought a set of lights back from Canada. So powerful, never been seen anywhere else, and I had them mounted by experts and everything onto my pontoon boat where we do all the catching of the adults. When the rivers are in flood and everything and are dirty, those lights can penetrate six meters into that water. So we can still see the shadow of the movement of the tuna. I also then engineered a trapping unit on the front of the boat, all automatic hydraulics, so that we could run at them, chop it down, pick them up, turn it around, and lay all the tuna in inside the boat. And that's where they stayed till we dropped them at below the lowest dam, which is Matahina. The biggest problem we have with those dams, of course, is the middle one. We've just found out over the last couple of years through their resource consents that we cannot get another resource consents for Anifanua for another 10 years. That really hurts me because at the end of the day, the majority of the fish stocks are killed from the middle dam. Even though the bottom dam has a few, we know that, we monitor it, but the middle dam could kill, up, kill all adult eels coming through the system. How are we going to change it? I don't know. I'm looking at all my people. What can we do? Take it to Parliament. I was hoping Jan Wright would be here today because she visited me at Matahina. And she was so thrilled to see the mahi and how we were doing it. But that doesn't really help our purpose. The purpose is, is looking after the most of the majority. They go back to Tonga to, to, to Tonga, east of Tonga, to lay their eggs. I used to listen to my grandfather and I used to say, Kuro, how do these eels come back here? Oh, they, they're like the salmon. They, they, they come back to the river. Carl Koro, they don't do that. He said, how do you know? Oh, you know, I know. The reason they come back is on the equatorial currents. So they are dispersed all around the motu. Oh, so that was that. So... It's, for me, uh, an honour to, to be here talking to you. And um, I 
think that if we haven't got it right in the next five years, then we'll be really struggling. If you take some of those tuna there, being over 101 years old, the biggest one we had was 43 kgs. Nine, three meters long. Had a spawning rate ending up to 50 million. So if you take all those tuna out, you've got nothing coming back. We have to rely on other rivers for our tuna to come back home. And that includes both species. Both species. When you go out to Mare Island and White Island and all that, we used to do a lot of diving. I took it upon myself to spend a week out there many years ago when the tuna migration was on and we knew the tuna from the Tarawira was safe. And consequently, Tarawira holds something like 64% long fin and 32% short. That's exactly where all our rivers should be. Whereas on science and technology, the Rangataiki River would be lucky to be running at 8% on Longfin and probably 80% in short. Transferring like we are, we've actually taken the whole mode of that fisheries out of their growing through the um, waterway. Because if we're moving them 100 k's, for them to swim it would take them two weeks, three weeks plus. So they're feeding on the way, getting stronger. So think about it. You drop them out of the tanks, have they got enough kai? What have we done? So we, we can only just use our imagination that they'll, they'll be fine, she'll be right. But there's no real true answer to it. No matter what science and technology tell you. I rely on my people, on my colours, my queer, and everything like that. And of course, uh, as I said, I've got to thank my lovely wife for, for putting up with me for so long. Sometimes she would say, dear, I might as well be divorced. Come on, mum, I'm not away that long. But sometimes the power company ring me up and says, we've been looking for you all day, you were supposed to ring us up. Well, I'm too busy, I'm elsewhere. You know, it's, it's just uh, one of those things that happens. Uh, and of course, uh, with new um, um, things coming through the system, uh, occupational health and safety, and when you're in power stations, you've got to do this, do that, do that, do everything. And at the end of the day, uh, to make them up, jump up and down, well, sometimes I might do it on purpose. It was, uh, no, it's you, right, I'll take my time, I'll go to the cafeteria and have a kai. And, and here they are saying, this fellow's supposed to be home at half past nine and it's midday. Well, we better send the truck up to see if he's there. So, um, anyway, everybody, it's been... Uh, Lovely to arrive here. I was actually sweating. I, I brought my son as my pilot. And I said, you know where we're going? I said, I haven't been here for many, many years. And uh, he said, yeah, Dad, we're right. Well, uh, our trip was re really excellent because with the uh, little uh, phones and everything and tap in, or no, turn right, turn left, go down this hill. And, yeah, oh, man, this is, uh, this is really... Uh, Fascinating. Leaving here last night. Okay, son, you know where we're going? Oh, yeah, Dad. Oh, look. Turn right, turn left, go down that street, and the next thing we're where, where, where we are. So science and technology in that way has certainly improved uh, that system. But don't be like my wife and I. I had an old phone, little tiny old phone. Could ring Wellington, do that. 
she decided to say to me, dear, oh, can I put my little lap, my phone uh, on our, our phone account? Yeah, mum. So we both walked into uh, Spark, and this is only a month ago. This fella come out like a flash. Can I help you? Oh, my wife said, oh, can I change my phone and uh, get the new one, the number and everything? Oh, not a problem, not a problem. Two and a half hours later, we both walked out with a new phone each. Still trying to work out how to work it. <laughs> Bring up somebody, it doesn't get me. Oh, gosh. So I've got to carry that young fella. Yeah, otherwise, I'll get lost. But I'm not going to take any more of your time because I think uh, uh, if I'd have bought the whole road show, it would have been absolutely marvellous because it, it showed the elder passes that we had worked on. We, we, we built ourselves by our hands. I formed the trust in 1997, Kokobu Trust. I had seven trustees and I'm the only one left. So we had trustees from Ngāti Manawa, Patuea Ngāti Hakra, myself, Tu Furitō, and um, um, we've lost all our trustees. And I've got two new ones now, Dan Hickador. Anybody know Dan Hickador? Uh, from AUT Auckland. Uh, we do a lot of um, education programs for AUT, and plus Awanu Aurangi. And um, so that's the journey that I've been on, and it's longer than 30 years. Roughly, I would say, going back, uh, working the rivers, doing what we had to do, would be in the 45 towards 50 years that I'd been. Even when I was engine driving at Tasman Pulp and Paper, and not only that we could stop and set a hinaki, and carry on to Murupara to pick up the, the logs. On the way back, we'd also be able to pick up some uh, venison. I was the train driver, so it didn't matter. If I saw venison way down the line, I'd give one little two. My guard at the back, he'd open his door and I'd slow right down. And on the way back, we'd pick it up. And uh, it, it was a wonderful life. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's uh, wonderful. I hope that we can find some goal in this whole take of our tuna and where we need to go. And now we're going to rely on our Whanganui uh, compatriots and um, Ken Mayer and the team uh, we will follow on that same suit. We will start pushing the issue more uh, with regards of uh, where we are with the Environmental Council. You know what? I want to tell you a little story. When we had the <coughs> Edgecombe flood, I actually rang up Matahina Dam five days before. And they said, will you please open your gates, John? This weather is going to be a good one even though we had a big one in 2004. So we chopped the lake two-thirds. The middle dam decided, well, this is a brilliant time to clean our lakes out with all the logs, the debris, the fauna flora, you name it. I went to visit them and there was a big island of sediment right in the middle of the lake. And they go, Bill, you, what's it? Look, it's moving, we're clearing all. I said, yes, but you're washing it right through the river. You're taking out the whole fisheries with it. Up to date, when I left two days ago from Matahina, we had already moved over a thousand ton of logs off the screens and around the lake. There's approximately, by going inside the lake, that there's another three or 4,000 ton of logs in the river, in the lake. I'm not worrying about those in the, in the middle of the lake, providing they stay there, would be, then become a good haven for the tuna. 
It's surprising that all our work in our mahi tells us that those that are living right up river are reliant not only to the branches falling off the trees, etc., etc., for their, you know, for the bugs to grow on. I put an equation over several years, look after, um, your group of invertebrates. How important, how important this paper means and your groups from your six-legged larvae, eight-legged, your mollusks and others are so important for our tuna. Because if they haven't got the kai, they're not going to stay there. So it's very important, you know. And there's one area that we did in Taranaki that we found the majority of what we have here also in all, some of their waterway. So this is one that uh, we, we are making sure that um, we look after. Our waterways have been hammered and, um, and of course uh, our district is all farming. The runoffs through the farms have been phenomenal. I meant to have brought you people a big cutout of the last big flood where it washed some homes off the farms with the shingle, the logs and debris. Every drain and every culvert was just choked up. So um, we still have to carry on and, and see where we have to go. But whatever Ken decides, we will follow it. Yes. <laughs> so, Coral Ken, yes, I'm going to keep my eye on you. Our other gentlemen from up north, um, we did a, a trip up right up north, and um, he's here today, and it's just so wonderful that people have come so far to this hui. Of our, of our freshwater fisheries and our tuna. So thank you everybody. Kia ora, kia ora koutou, katoa. Ah.